day is, you know, I was beat by an ex-boyfriend. I was almost murdered. No, I was kidnapped. No. I was tortured for about seven or eight hours. I want to tell you a little bit about that story, not to tell you about the story, but to glorify God and how he pulled me through it every step of the way. He put all the people in my life, all my friends, families, just everybody, um, the legal system, everybody was just placed perfectly in line to just save me and to just protect God's people. Um, feel the spirit on me now. <laughs> so I'm going to start by saying, um, so this was August in 2021. I started dating a guy, kind of met online. Um, he had told me he was in prison. I have a, a history of not making the best. I have a good boyfriend now, but I have a history of not making the best. <laughs> but he's Christian. My other ones weren't. I don't think so. Um, I have a, a history of choosing a couple bad men in my life. So he told me he was in prison, and I, I you know, I kind of thought he said that he, that he was in prison because of uh, almost killing his stepfather, who um, he told me he had abused him and his brother and his mother, and, and I kind of just bought that, and I started dating him. And, We weren't dating long, we were dating about three months, and he was very possessive and controlling and things like that, and should have saw some red flags there too. Um, but we took a trip down to uh, Blackwater Falls, West Virginia. Wow, the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Still to this day, I don't care what happened to me, that's God's country, it's a beautiful place. Beautiful waterfalls, country, mountains, you know, um, some family from West Virginia, some of my blood's from West Virginia, so, I, you know, it's just it's just a beautiful place there. We went down there, we had a great time for, you know, we went down on a Friday night, we had a great time. Um, Sunday, we were going to go watch a sunset before, uh, before we went home, and, um, so, we went down to the falls, and he had bought a pocket knife right before we went down. I didn't think anything of it. We're in the middle of the woods. And um, so we went down to, the, down to the waterfall. We're down this steep path that you have to go down. It's hard to even get down into. It's really hard to get down into. There's a big waterfall, rocks everywhere. It's um, probably about a mile or two in, you know. There's nothing but gravel, and it's a very secluded place. Um, so he was playing the guitar and kind of kind of asked me to do some like light sage and do some things and I didn't know where he was headed with that. I didn't know his religious like I kind of knew, but he had told me and he just it was getting kind of dark. He had told me he was seeing some dark figures and things like that, you know. So um, you know, and of course I talked about God and I talked about Jesus with him, um, but he didn't really seem too interested in that part of it, the Jesus part anyway, I think, you know, he said, oh, I've read the Bible, and, but, I don't know what happened exactly, but something very demonic just came over him, he started talking about how he was, um, tortured when he was in prison, and all of a sudden, he just, his whole, his whole demeanor just changed, you know, like he was possessed, I believe he was possessed, um, so he took the knife that he had had. He had gone over to a rock, um, maybe, I don't know how many feet, 10, 15, 20 feet away, and threatened suicide with the knife. Um, I'm a mental health counselor. <laughs> I've been thinks of being through some of this stuff. But, you know, I just slowly kind of stepped over, like trying to talk him down out of it. You know, please don't hurt yourself. And then he came over with the knife and threatened my life and said, no, it's you that, to, to, that deserves to die, not me, um, waving the knife at me. Um, at this point, I was petrified. We were in the middle of the rocks and the waterfall. Um, I uh, Then all of a sudden, he told me he was going to beat and kill me with his bare hands. He preferred to do that. So he... Uh, had me go search for his glasses, I think he had all the time, but he had, he had treated me like a prey the entire time. He was like telling me to go under the water or he would kill me. 
and this went on for hours, and then he started, every time I would get close to getting away, so like to go up the trail, he would hit me. So I was repeatedly struck in the face, um, probably for a few hours before I got out of there, at least a couple hours. Um, just kept hitting me, and uh, you know, said horrible things to me, told me he was gonna kill me, where he was gonna bury me, and um, and he, I remember him asking me, he had talked a lot about God, and he knew my faith, and I remember him asking me, where's your God now? When he said that, I started, I looked up at the falls, and I just imagined Jesus on the cross, and I just said, Jesus, I don't want to die, I just said, give me your strength, please just give me your strength, I need your strength, and I think that's the only way I withstood all the blows that I took, was just praying for Jesus' strength. And then after that, he started having like almost like a panic attack, and you know he couldn't catch his breath. And that kind of, and it was like right after I started praying for the strength of Jesus that he did that. But he had my keys, he had my phone in his bag on his, he had a um, a guitar bag on his back. He had uh, taken my shoes. He had his shoes. It was very rocky when I would try to run. He would catch me. So he, he was still breathing just long enough. I mean, had that attack just long enough. I actually went up with him because I kind of almost, I, I just couldn't get away from him. Um, he had a knife. I was scared to get, you know, I, I just couldn't get far enough away from him. So I kind of was just like, let's just get out of here. He's like, I can't take you home looking like that. You know, I have, now I have to kill you. Um, my face was so beat by that time. Um, but I climbed my way up the, I don't know how I, you know, I, it was Jesus' strength. It was the Holy Spirit that, that just guided me through that because there was no way I should have stayed standing. I, by this point, I hadn't felt fell once and I was repeatedly struck. So we on our way up to the car, he hit me one more time and he broke my jaw that time. Mm. And I hit the floor. And I just remember him saying, get up. And I got straight up. And I, I mean, the Holy Spirit gave me that strength. I just felt the Holy Spirit going through me. Uh, he forced me into to drive. He threatened to kill me again, throw me off of a bridge there. Um, he forced me to drive the car, but he yeah, had the knife at that time, forced me into the car through the knife. I think there was another knife in the console of my car. So I didn't have a GPS. I, you know, my phone was, was wet at the time. It wasn't working. Um, he was in the car beside me. He was still hitting me in the chest and the, and the arms and things like that. Uh, but I was beaten badly. He had put in, he had put uh, gauze over my one eye. He put a bandaid over my other eye. Um, I was bleeding. I was had a, by this time I was driving. I just knew I had to go. What was it north? Northwest, you know, to go home. I knew I had to go northwest, so I just followed, followed the roads I could, and those roads were very windy. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there's some bends around here. I was by this time, I was, I couldn't see straight. My vision was blurred. Um, I was kept nodding, you know, I was nodding. I, you know, I got up through some of those hills in West Virginia. He wanted to take me to a hotel where he told me he was going to torture and kill me. So when we got to a, the first hotel where he was going to go to, I, I told him, I told him, no, this hotel looks like it has bed bugs. It looks nasty. Let's just keep going. Because I knew if he took me in there, I was going to die there. And I thought, God, just get me through this. You know, just, just take me to, you know, take me to safety. And, and he bought it, and we kept driving. Um, it was COVID time. <laughs> it was 2021. There wasn't anything open. It was one o'clock in the morning by the, you know, 12, one o'clock in the morning by this time. We're going through uh, like Washington. We got pulled over. Uh, so what happened was I was driving. Like I said, I couldn't see the lines in the road. I looked back. I'm on the other side of the road. And I just said, God, Jesus, take the wheel. You know, you got to send, you got to send angels. You got to save me because I'm not going to make it. I knew at that point I was going to pass out, and we were driving, and he had just passed out, um, and 
then all of a sudden, when I just knew, I just started nodding and I just couldn't stay awake anymore. I just prayed to just take the wheel. And I saw a light I've never seen so bright stop me right in the middle of the road. I mean, it was an all-encompassing, bright, white light. And I knew I was safe at that point, or I didn't know if I died or if I was safe at first because I was just like, I felt this warmth, I felt this love, I just felt, and I was freezing cold. I was in the, forced to be in the water and I was just felt warmth all over me. I've never felt anything so, I mean, I felt the Holy Spirit, but this was just like, to the nth, it was like God's glory came down, his presence came down, his angels came down, it was just like an army had come down. It was like, and I didn't know what had happened, but here on the left, when, when the light kind of dissipated and I kind of came to, there was a police officer on the left-hand side of the road. And um, so I was really out of it by this time. <laughs> uh, pretty bad concussion. You know, my face was swollen, so I had pulled into, um, made a right and turned into the Dollar General driving kind of erratically and kind of on purpose so that she would pull me over some some of on purpose and some because the concussion was so bad so a female officer pulls us over i'm still kind of scared at the time this is a female officer he's got a knife in the car um he wakes up she pulls us over and she asks and he kind of responds to me and says oh i fell on a rock she could tell by looking at my face my jaw was broken my face was pretty battered so she asked if I wanted an EMT and I immediately said yes and the EMT came and I was placed in the EMT and he was she put him in the cruise she was very smart yeah. she put him in the cruiser and said you're not being arrested right now you're just being detained until the so she called some male officers to come to the scene and I thank God for her I thank God Maria Cucuro was the officer's name and I thank God she was there she, she called the officers I finally did tell them what happened to me and I all I could pretty much say at that point was yes this she said all you have to do is say yes he did this to you I was really in bad shape so I said yeah you know he did this to me so I went to the hospital um, my sister and her husband Miles came to pick me up with me through it all the way <laughs> um, my sister didn't recognize me and I walked out of the hospital she didn't even <laughs> so battered at that point um, but God really saved me I mean it's not about how battered I was because God God was there I mean right in the nick of time and he put people right in the place so I find out that this I find out that his record I found out that his record really was that uh, he had a bad record he had um, first of all he had uh, another domestic and an abduction, and I found out that the girl that he had um, done this to was actually, I think, like four or five months pregnant at the time, and he had killed the baby. The baby was dead after he attacked her. In the state of Ohio, there wasn't a um, there wasn't a heartbeat law, so he just got an abduction and uh, domestic violence and served, I think, three years for that. Um, he, had got, he had gotten into another, something similar. They had knives were involved. There was another altercation with another woman where it was almost the same kind of thing. It progressively got worse, but he got out of that one. I don't think she testified. I don't think she went and testified through, pulled through the whole thing. Um, the case was dropped. And then when he was in prison, he got another charge for um, assault charge, complicity, or robbery I think in like a um, uh, intimidating a witness so you know you think you're through this and everything and then I've got eight weeks of healing I had to have jaw surgery I've got six weeks to heal to heal before I return to work you know my work my, my work told me to I mean they said to, just to tell everybody I was in an accident I'm a mental health therapist so I think you know people expect this kind of thing not to happen to us but and I think a lot of domestic violence victim and victims of violence are shamed and they're just yep. you know and it's just it's it's our fault and and we're 
week and I don't know, it was just uh, the guilt and shame at this point were, were hard, it was difficult. I really prayed about that. I joined a group, uh, it was called Reboot Recovery. It was a Christian based group, it was an online group, it was around the COVID time again. And I had some amazing group members there. Uh, Heather and John Flint, um, her husband's a pastor, and she was she was a, a EMT who had um, been in an accident, and she lost, she wasn't able to speak or walk, you know, she had to learn how to do all that again, and it took her years, and um, her mom was a, a victim, and she she helped me through a lot of that, Katie did. she was also a, 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 one of the um, leaders of the group, so there were two co two co leaders. I started. I went through the group myself. It was a group of what, five to ten women who just had different things. The, the group was for. Um, I went. I joined a general trauma group. There were also groups for military. There were groups for um, also for first responders. But they were awesome. They were like family to me. Um, and they really helped me through. And then I became, a, uh, I'm not doing it right now since I had Charlotte, but for a while I did co-lead some groups with them and, you know, trying to get back and helping other people because I feel like, you know, I'm just, <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> breathing. There's nothing special about me. My faith is what got me through this. Yes. You know, I should be, I sh shouldn't be here right now, <laughs> but through the grace and mercy of God, I'm here, and you know I thank God every day that I'm here to to see my daughter, my oldest daughter, who was there at the time, and that I got to have my youngest daughter. And you know the story didn't stop there because the trial. <laughs> you know people think that, that that's hard. It's hard on a victim to go oh, through yeah. a trial. It's not an easy thing. Um, lasts for years, and you know, a lot of people just kind of give up at that point. So I think the. You know, the first trial I went to, he was charged. He was charged with first. He was charged with, uh, I think it was felonious assault or something like that in the state of Pennsylvania. That's where we were pulled over. Uh, so I went to court. They were only going to give him two to four years for all the record, and then I, they didn't have his record. So I went to the domestic violence advocate in Palmiana County. And I got the records, and then they were maybe going to give him five to ten years when they saw his record. So, you know, Miles went to court with me for the <laughs> the first um, run there, pre-trial or whatever, preliminary hearing. And he pretty much told on himself at the preliminary hearing. I mean, I, I dressed in armor every time I went in that courtroom in the Holy Spirit. I asked the Holy Spirit to speak through me. And... You know, I really feel like, I mean, the, even the attorney was like, okay, you have three choices here. <laughs> you know, you can get an attorney, uh, you can what, plead no, no contest, and, or, you, you know, you can defend yourself. He defended himself and almost admitted to guilt. Um, so that was just the preliminary, so we had to go back to the tr to trial. Um, so it ended up that they sent this down to West Virginia because of the jurisdiction, because it happened in West Virginia. Best thing they could have done. <laughs> um, and I wish no ill upon the guy that did this, but um, I really, oh, God, God. <laughs> I really feel like that, um, you know, God was putting down his protection on, you know, here on other people. You know, it wasn't for revenge. This was for protection, so this didn't happen to other women or children. And I feel like that's why God stood by this. And I never, I never used force with him. I never hit him. I never laid a hand on him. I prayed through all this, um, and he stood by me, and he was faithful every step of the way. So, tr Trooper Justin J. Smittle got a hold of me. He's now a sergeant, sergeant uh, West Virginia State Police. He got my story, and of course this was a long process, but he later charged him with attempted murder, malicious wounding, and um, 
kidnapping. Kidnapping holds a life sentence in, in West Virginia. So this is still a long, a long journey, you know, to go through. Uh, you know, it's still, it's still a couple years down, the, or a year down the road, or whatever. So I mean, I get a hold of the prosecuting attorney. I'm working with the domestic violence uh, advocate in, in Columbia County. He's really helped me too. She got all of his records for me and everything. Um, and she was really just gave me a lot of inspiration through this as well. She knew him from Columbia County and some of the cases there um, so God was faithful I mean I I just I'm just so in awe and I'm just so amazed at the people he put in place for the, to make this happen you know we went down Brittany went down with me before uh, Jason went down with me the last time and uh so the last and final court hearing, we'll kind of fast forward it to there. Uh, they selected the jury. Uh, and, you know, that was a hard process. You know, I remember a time when I, I called our pastor, we got a hold of him and said, you know, you have to pray with me because I was shaking like a leaf, you know, as I, they were telling, you know, I was gonna be cross-examined. And my sister Brittany was there and she was telling me, they were telling all these lies about me and saying I, you know, all kinds of stuff about it wasn't true to plead his case. He said I hit him with a rock and not just all kinds of stuff that he had said he had done in self-defense and, and all kinds of other lies too. And um, so that was the hardest. I think that was one of the hardest parts was having to be cross-examined and yeah. you know it's just the, tw the truth be twisted. But God stood by me through all that too and. You know, they didn't really have anything to go on here, and I had a lot of evidence. I had pictures, horrible pictures, you know. So I had enough evidence. I had the testimony of the police officer. I had the EMT reports. Jur jury convicted him, and they found him guilty of both the malicious wounding and the kidnapping. They didn't try the attempted murder case, because the kidnapping case was um, a lay sentence anyway. It was a little harder to prove, I guess, the attempted murder, but uh, it drove me out of state and everything. They had tried to use that, that try to throw. They had tried to throw it out that um, because we had left the state of West Virginia, and I said, well, 90 percent of my injuries occurred in West Virginia. So uh, the jury convicted him of both, and so he got a life sentence. And then they had bifurcated the mercy hearing. So the mercy hearing was if they get. Um, they're allowed to have parole or not so I had to wait another couple months before I heard about that and also the case could have been dismissed but God was with me I mean I asked God to ride with me in the car I prayed I sang worship songs I read scripture and God went with me in that courtroom and he stood before me and he gave me the words and he was convicted and the judge sentenced him to Life without parole. Wow. 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 Seven years. And two to four to begin with. Okay. MPA. Wow. Wow. Two to four. <laughs> and then I think it was like five to seven or five to ten or something like that. They wanted but, the plea bargain and you told no. Oh, you mean yeah. this time? Yeah, they did. Ask, they did ask me to plea bargain it, and I spoke. To, I, I really. I really prayed on it. It was hard to go to trial. I didn't want to go to trial. I didn't want to relive all this. And it's no. it's it's easier for me to get up and speak about this and tell what God's done for me. It wasn't hard for me today because God saved me. Um, but it's hard to get on there and put on trial and <laughs> cross-examined and you know try to be made out to be a liar and different things like that. But um, yeah, God saved me through every step of the way. And. Though it was hard, it was worth it because I thought about that baby, you know, that he had killed, and I thought, I, you know, I, I need to do this, and I need to do this so nobody else will be harmed. And I just thank God. I mean, He was just with me every step of the way. He put, I want to, you know, I thank everybody. I want to thank. I have so many people I want to thank. I think I wrote them down because, <laughs> and 
and I could break some stuff down, but you know, you get nervous up here, and I think I just mostly speak from the heart. I do really like um, Second Corinthians. I I like the whole verse eight through eighteen, but I won't say all that to you. <laughs> put you through all that tonight. So it says we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I mean, I. I do this for the glory of God and then so other people can stand up because, you know, I mean, being, even me being a therapist, this was difficult for me because, uh, you know, I didn't get a lot of publicity because it was in a small town and it wasn't around here, but people found out this is a small town, you know, and, um, you know, I, I had some other things in my life, so, <laughs> but I think it's all working for God's glory. I, you know, I've had some other things go on. I mean, I ended up having Charlotte and um, all that in the process. And God, God stood, I mean, Charlotte's biological father's not in the picture. And, uh, you know, I think that God gave me, I was, you know, I didn't know how I was going to make it as a single mom, you know? I mean, yeah, I have a job, I work full time, but it's, it's not easy. Um, but I, you know, I've never, my daughter's never had to want for anything. Through the church, through friends, family, I mean, her shower, I had enough diapers to last. Probably, I mean, I've never had to buy diapers. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, my daughter's never wanted for anything. Um, you know, I've, we had a hard life growing up. She's never had to have, she's never had to have that. So I thank God for that. You know, I thank God for my girls. I thank God for the healing that's come over us. That this, you know, that we've gotten through this. I thank God my other daughters, you know, doing fine in college. And you know, I was really. I think that was a lot of the struggle was the shame and the guilt. And God, you know, when I went through that reboot, recovery group, that Christian group. It, you know, some of the things I didn't realize that being um, really self-sufficient and independent could be a prideful thing, <laughs> but it was because I learned that I needed help. And I learned to accept that help because if not, I was shutting I was shutting the world out. And I've learned how to I'm you know I'm still learning, but I'm really learning to let people in. And it's a really good feeling to be able to let people into your life and not to be so self-sufficient. And I'm never self-sufficient. My reliance is always on God. And in my therapy, you know, I used to get so anxious about not being able to help people. And, you know, when I feel that feeling come over me, I just submit it to God. And usually it just works out. You know, I just, you know, your strength is made, I mean, my strength is made, getting flustered okay. It's okay so what's the verse I'm trying to say strength is made perfect in my weakness. In my weakness yeah so I brought a word down here but I didn't go up much and I really feel that way you know my strength's been made perfect Jesus has really just given me so much strength to pull through all this and I'm just so glad I'm here to stand before you all day and give this and today and give this testimony. And when you've had a life or death experience, it just makes you look at life in a whole new way. It just makes like everything's different, you know. Everything's brighter. Everything means more. Um, and devil still tries to get me, you know. He's, he tries to wear me down. <laughs> I have a full-time job. I have a baby. You know, we've been struck, we battled with some illnesses all winter long. Well, I, I, you know, I pulled through, and I think God just keeps giving me strength, and I just keep going. And I thank God every day for the life I have, and the, you know, for letting me live on. And I thank Him for the Holy Spirit that He's given us. And I just, I just want to thank. Thank God, first and foremost. Thank Jesus. Um, I want to thank Pastor Dirk, Stephanie, and the church. They've been like family to me. They've stood through me through everything. I want to thank my daughter.
daughter Ilea, all my, all my brothers and sisters. Um, I want to thank Stephanie and Miles, Brittany, they all went, you know, helped me with trial. Joanna, Sarah, Christina, Jason, all my other friends, all my family, uh, prosecutor, Savannah Wilkins, Sergeant Justin J. Smittle, uh, Maria Kukrove of the Mount Pleasant Police, Elaine Klaus, Catholic Charities Domestic Violence Advocate, uh, Heather and John Flint and Katie Spitz, and group members and co-leaders of uh, Christian-based trauma reboot. Just thank everybody for helping me through this and thank you all for being here and thank you all for your support. There's people that wanted to shame me through this and tell me this is a private thing that you shouldn't talk about. But I feel like the, the, this is truth and I feel like God wants us to speak the truth. He wanted his glory revealed and I feel like you know the enemy has tried to stop me from getting up here and do that. He's tried to shame me. And I feel like this is going to be very well. And no one's going to stop me from giving God that glory. <laughs> Thank you all. Amen. Thank 
Thank you. That's what I did. I put on the armor every time I went in that courtroom. I put on the armor every time I was going to court. You know, I, I try to wear it every day. I still try to wear it every day. I try to wear it to work every day. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I didn't break down very, very much up here, but. Um, and it's not I, everybody keeps telling me I'm strong it's, I'm I'm really not that strong it's it's the God in me that's what I always say hey. this is the God in me hey. that's the strength that shines through like the light Matthew 5, 11 through 16 says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives you light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, yeah, I love that verse. And there were a couple others in here I was going to say, but I won't keep you here because <laughs> I have a lot of verses in me. Yeah. So I, Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live in Christ, but Christ who live in me. I love that one. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I had so many verses here that I just, just helped me through it all. I just read the Bible, and I praise God. And any time I do feel, you know, sometimes I do feel enemy attacks. I don't want to say, oh, yes, I never feel these attacks. When I do, I pray, I praise. You know, I listen to praise music. I suit up in my armor, and I pray, and then I usually just feel better. I mean, I was sick yesterday. I was very, very sick. I had a stomach flu, and I woke up better today. So yeah. I think that was the enemy trying to attack me to get me not to do this. But here I am, and nothing, you know, is going to stop what, what God has wanted for, for us to do for his glory. So. Yeah. And I, and I pray for any of the, you know, any victims or family, because I know there's a lot of women over, out here that didn't survive this. And, the, I mean, there were, thank God, by my faith, I survived this. And I thank God every day. And, you know, I pray for any victims and who didn't survive or anybody that's going through this now. There is hope and there is a way out of here. There is a way out of this. It's not easy, but there is a way out. So I just pray for everybody that's ever been involved with any domestic violence. I, I did, you know, and I pray that this, a lot of times I feel like this is a generational curse too, so I just pray that any curse of domestic violence be broke. And I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Let's give the Lord a hand.